Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. I believe 2019 is going to be sensational. So, I need to pray again, sorry. So, God, I just ask in Jesus' name that your heart will be revealed to us and your goodness. And I can draw out of many things you've been saying to me, some relevant truths that will help us start this year. I ask you this in Jesus' name. So, um, you know how, um, if you look back over your life, you can realize that there were certain things that happened, maybe certain people you met, maybe a book you read, a movie you saw that sort of became a signpost that said, you know, take this little detour, come over here. You know, learn something that will help you on your journey. Or I'm willing to sail boat metaphors right now. So imagine you're sailing someplace and you adjust the rigging just a little bit. And at first it may not seem like it's made a big difference because you just go a little ways. But as your life goes on, you realize, you know, I'm changed because of that. So I'm a bit of a historian and I'm always trying to understand the things that have influenced our nation, you know, my life, you know, people I love, you know, just trying to understand and get a clearer worldview and personal insight. And, you know, so looking back over my life, I think, you know, there have been some really key things that have changed the way I live life. Um, for example, someone 50 years ago introduced me to C.S. Lewis, and I became a disciple of C.S. Lewis. I, probably read the Narnia books to all my children and grandchildren almost yearly for decades. You know, I've told Jimmy that if someone started a church in Narnia, I'm out of here. <laughs> because, you know, it just it speaks to me, his metaphors, his worldview. And it's not like I totally, 100%, you know, agree with everything he says, but it's just a connection. And it's sort of adjusted who I am and the way I see life. And another one is Watchman Nee. Um, He's this um, Chinese theologian, and there are two or three of his books and messages that change the way I see life. I mean, number one is called Two Principles of Conduct, and it asks the question, you know, do you have to be right, or would you rather be loving? I know that sounds like Dr. Phil, but you know, that question, especially for a Viking, has been very transformative to me. I don't need to be right. You know, I don't need to have all the answers. What I need to be is loving and kind and let the Spirit work in my life. So his understanding of that truth, you know, was birthed in me. Um, about five years ago, someone recommended a book that comes out of Bethel called Culture of Honor by Danny Silk. And it was such a blessing to me because for 40 plus years, I had this heart at Valley Christian High School next door where I've been teaching to have an atmosphere where people feel important, whether it's a student or a teacher or the guy who fills the vending machine. I want people to step into Valley Christian High School and feel important. And um, I didn't have the quite vocabulary for it. I just wanted it to be a loving, honoring place. You know, that no one was bullied, no one was made to feel less than. So reading this book, Culture of Honor, I realized that's what it is, a culture of honor. You know, that's what I want to be part of. You know, that's what this church is. You know, and those of you who have jobs that you have some responsibility for leadership, you know, that's your responsibility, is to establish a culture of honor. And um, so that's just sort of changed the way I interpret my dream to, you know, for, for my school. So then a little over a year ago, one of my graduates recommended this business book called The Dream Manager. And all someone has to do is mention a book, and I'm on Amazon. I probably order every book someone mentions, you know, within 24 hours. 
maybe, you know, not maybe every one of them, but I'm, I'm Amazon's best customer. You know, the mailman, the delivery guy knows my name. You know, I often give him a bottle of water when he comes. I mean, we have a relationship, you know, because I just, I'm obsessive about learning stuff. I want to learn, I want to understand. So it was odd that this book gripped me so much because it's a business book. It's not a Christian book, it's a business book. And it's about a janitorial business. You know, and if you can imagine me getting captivated about a story about cleaning toilets, you realize that this had to be God. You know, because I just kept reading it and reading it. And then I got it on audio book, and I listened to it three or four times driving to Austin to see my kids. And I just kept thinking, what is it that God's trying to tell me? And I realized it was just dovetailing with what he was saying to me and the culture of honor idea. And something was just sort of stirring inside of me. So I sort of want to share that saga with you because as I was praying about sharing, getting to share the first Sunday of 2019, I really felt like what God was speaking to me and what I wanted to speak to you is about dreams. So basically, this story is about a company of 400 janitors who, of course, hate their job. Who wouldn't? None of you as a child dreamed of someday cleaning toilets. You know, it's not the dream job. It's not why you went to school. It's not why you worked hard. You know, it's, it's kind of what's called a dead-end job. So the managers of this job, this business, are trying to figure out how to engage their workers more because the average time someone stays in that job is about three or four months. You know, they come in, they get trained, they work for a while, they hate it, and they leave. So the goal was, how do we lower turnover? So it's a, you know, it's a long story, but um, they come up with this idea of walking alongside the people who work together and standing with them about their personal dreams and goals. And they hire people called dream managers who come in and talk to the people on a monthly basis about what they want to accomplish in their lives, what their personal dreams are. And for most of these workers who are usually minorities and low education, they're real simple things, things we may take for granted, like having a car, or having an education, or learning English, or having my kids get to go to college. You know, they're just really some of the basic things of the American dream. But what happened is as they honored their employees, their employees started caring about their work and about each other. And the culture of these 400 janitors was transformed. And they started caring about each other and helping each other. And the dream managers were sort of like life coaches and sort of like financial advisors. And, but most of all, they were like friends. You know, so this is not a new thing. Treat people well, they're, they're do better. You know? <coughs> this is not a new thing, but there was an element of it that was just speaking to me. And I was just trying to figure out what is it that you're saying, God? So I realized my whole life I've been a dream manager um, as a mother, you know, my three sons, nothing mattered in the whole world more to me than seeing them fulfill their dreams. You know, I wanted them to be good, I wanted them to be smart, I wanted them to be righteous and godly, but I wanted them to be joyful and their lives to be abundant. I can remember when my middle son wanted to get his pilot's license on his 16th birthday, and I didn't want him to fly. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to. You know, the first time he flew over the house, I was laying on the carpet praying protection over him. You know, but it was his dream. And I wanted to walk with him through his dream. You know, as a teacher, you know, for 45 years, I feel like my main thing is go for it. You know, just have a dream, you know, seek God. You know, what were you created for? You know, find your destiny, you know, prepare, you know. Like everything in my relationship with my kids is like that. Um, as a jail chaplain, you know, I'm always telling the women, this isn't your destiny, this doesn't define you. You're just passing through. You know, you have purpose in life. You're going to leave this place empowered. You're going to become a woman of influence. You know, you're going to be reconciled to your families. And your story of being in Cameron County Jail 
is going to be part of your credentials in ministry. Like, I was there, I know what I'm talking about, and this is what God did for me. So, you know, it's just, it's something very core to who I am. And also, as a wife, I um, realized that for 42 years, my probably number one goal in life was to walk with my husband um, through his destiny, through his calling, to be behind him, holding up his arms, to support him, to, you know, affirm who he was called to be, you know, and I liked that job. <laughs> it was a good job for me. I liked being the lady behind, holding up the arms. So what happened when he died is a huge part of my dreams died with him. You know, and I just, I, I always have known that, but I just am learning it in a bigger way because we, um, we hadn't talked much about one of us being alone because all of our parents lived into their 80s and 90s and we were just barely 60 and, you know, we'll talk about that later. Um, I remember he got a life insurance policy one time and I was so annoyed with him, you know, I was really kind of nagging about it because it was just for $10,000 but it was going to, I'd have to write a check every month for $10.47. And and we didn't have an extra ten dollars and forty-seven cents for one thing, and the idea of having it on him instead of on me was just stupid. Because I was going to die a decade before he did, you know. So then he would have some money to have some fun when I was gone, you know. I just, I was just annoyed, and for years I wrote the check and I thought this is so stupid, you know, because, you know, I just, I wasn't prepared, and um, I've got it tell a story myself, I may have told this before, but um, the early months after he died, I was very um, sarcastic with people. It was just the way I coped. And the pastors of um, ICC, the ordinance, who were sweet friends, their son came to my school, and I just love him to death, invited me out to dinner. And they were being so nice, you know, they were comforting the new widow lady, and you know, and um, so they asked me, like, well, what are your dreams and goals and plans for the future? I said, to die soon. <laughs> soon, the sooner the better, to get out of this place as soon as I can. That's my goal, considering all sorts of techniques of suicide. And, you know, I, mean, I was, you know, and, and I saw that we just, you know, like, uh, they never invited me out again. <laughs> Obviously, with the friends I hope, but still, you know, I just, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I did scare them. So, this is what I feel like. I think God has given me these three truths that He's been speaking to me, and I feel are for you too. And one of them just crystallized a few weeks ago. I was driving home from Austin and praying, probably listening to my book on audio tape. And, and I started getting this picture in my mind, and I just got this image, and I kept thinking, what is that? What is this thing I keep seeing in the back of my mind? And it was sort of like a sandwich or an Oreo or something. It was like these two things with something wonderful in between. And I thought, what is this? You know, so I turned off the radio, and I was just driving through King Ranch. I said, okay, God, I think you're trying to tell me something. What is it? You know, tell me. And what I felt like he said to me is that, Human nature is sort of attracted to structure. We want things to be safe. We want to know what we are supposed to do. You know, we're inclined towards performance orientation. So we are drawn to kind of the Old Testament law, legalism. You do this, 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 and you will be blessed. You know, and you know, there's this Spirituality from Moses, or even the last great prophet of the Old Testament, John the Baptist, there's a spirituality that has to do with sacrifice and obeying laws, and it's a, it's a very true and profound and necessary part of our life. You know, and then I saw like on the other side, the other piece of bread or the other chocolate cookie was um, the Apostle Paul, you know, such a brilliant theologian. You know, read Romans, oh my goodness, it makes you feel retarded, you know, it's just, he's just so brilliant. And there's just the truth of the theology and the interpretation of what the coming 
of Christ meant, you know, the truths of the gospel. And there's these two things, and we're drawn to both of them. But the truth of the matter is, is Jesus Christ, the person, is what's between them. It is what holds them together. It's what makes them important. You know, and I think that's one reason Islam is getting so popular right now is because Islam um, gives us all these rules. You know, Sharia law, you do this, 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 and you go to heaven and you have a good life. And, you know, like, there's something about us that is drawn to that because it seems safe. But really, we don't follow Jesus Christ. And what does he look like? He's a dream manager. He says to people, what do you want? You know, what do you want? And you can say, well, I want to be given back my sight. I'm blind, duh. Why are you asking? I want to walk and cripple, duh. You know, I want my demon-possessed son delivered, duh. You know, you say, why does he ask? And it's because he's a dream manager. He wants to say, I value what you want. And I want to help you experience it. I want to gift it to you. You know, and I just, I see Jesus as just incredibly generous and loving and merciful and fun. You know, I see him in the home of sinners. I see him at weddings turning water into wine. And I don't approve of that. You know, and he's just having this abundant, loving, transforming life. And, you know, we're kind of drawn to religion. We're sort of drawn to, you know, structure. And, you know, if there's anything I feel like God's saying to me right now, what I feel he's saying for 2019, is just focus on the Savior. You know, be like him. You know, I think of on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was talking to Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophet, and God just said, hey, this is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. You know, and it's not that I don't, I still love to study the Ten Commandments. I still love the feast days in Leviticus 23. I still am plowing through Hebrews and trying to understand. But the truth of the matter is, I just want to fall in love again with the Lord Jesus Christ and all of his goodness and sweetness and mercy and love and just let my life more reflect him, you know, and just kind of step away from having to have all the answers, you know. I spent last week in Seattle with my husband's um, brother. He only had one brother and he's been an atheist for about 40 years. and. Um, and I just realized I felt so free to sit and talk to them. They're very, very left-wing, very, very political, say terrible things about our president, words I haven't used for 50 years, you know. And, um, you know, and I just loved them. I just felt this amazing love for them, and I felt like these walls and prejudices just kind of come down. So. Um, so one of, you know, so the first thing I just want to say to you is that God wants us to have dreams. There's a scripture, it's in um, Psalms 37, I think, 4. And it says, you know, to rejoice in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I remember years ago hearing a little different translation of that. And it, and it basically said, as you rejoice in the Lord. He will plant desires and dreams in your heart. You know, he will put into your heart. So like as we worship and as we are grateful to the Lord, what happens is that these, um, these desires, these things that we want to do with our lives, those things that make our lives abundant, um, they're given to us. And if we're religious, we'll say, oh no, you know, I'm not going to indulge in that, you know, I'm going to be sacrificial and live an austere life. And there's a place for that, but there's also a place for wonderful, wonderful fun, you know, to celebrate. I think Jesus was a celebrant. You know, he says, I want to give you my joy, and I want your joy to be full. You know, so I just, I think that 
we we make God harsh. Um, this year, as I was reading through the Gospels, I was just caught again by every time Jesus told a story about um, stupid people. Um, they were always criticizing the judge or the owner of the vineyard or you know the person who represented God. And they would say things like, I knew you were a harsh man. I knew you were exacting. I knew you would want to sow where, or, yeah, sow where you did not reap. So therefore, I hid what you gave me. I didn't experience it. I didn't enjoy it. And, um, you know, Jesus says, you know, depart from me. You know, you miss the whole point. You know, Josiah taught us years ago that song, um, he's a good, good father. And I find myself just humming that all the time. But sometimes we forget how good he is. We just forget how generous he is and how much he wants our lives to be full. I had sort of an interesting experience as far as a personal dream. And I'm not positive I could have stepped out on this one if I hadn't been reading this book and thinking about it. But um, for the last 25 years, I've taken my senior class on um, trips as often as possible to Europe. We can't always afford it, but we'll at least go to New York or Seattle or Florida or cruise or someplace. So um, I always love it. I love spending the time with the students. I love, I love to travel. So is this right about five years ago when we were in Ireland? Is that five years ago? You were there. Oh, you went to California. Oh, yeah, that's Miguel. Oh, yeah, okay, Ireland. I was thinking, oh, you know, I have an Irish story here. But, okay, so we were in Ireland, and um, it was just wonderful. I had never been there before, and um, I have some Irish in me, mostly Viking, but some Irish. And I was standing up on this hillside overlooking this thousand-year-old monastery, and I started feeling very emotional because I realized I never got to take my children on trips because um, I spent all my money taking my students on trips. You know, for six months before a trip, I would save every dollar I had. And, you know, I paid full price for everything. I never took a penny from the kids. And then for the next six months, I'd be paying it off. You know, so I had three of my grandchildren who were becoming teenagers that year. And I was thinking, you know, I'll never get to take my own children, my own grandchildren on a trip like this because I could never afford it. So I was standing on the hillside. I said, God, please someday make a way that I can take my kids. You know, because there's a part of me that was like this wound that my children did without because everything was poured into the school. There's like, I guess it's a root of bitterness. That's what I think it probably was. But anyhow, I was standing there and I remember this very clearly. So then about a year ago, I come back from a trip to um, Paris and London with my last year seniors, 24 of them. We got to have this wonderful trip. And I was you know, going through my finances, trying to figure out how I was going to pay it off. And um, I realized that the life insurance policy on my husband was still like just making $50 a month. I didn't want it. I was just waiting. I thought when I got to 18000 I would just divide it amongst my kids. I'd never spent it. I didn't want it. But I realized that this might be enough to take my family to Ireland. And um, so that's what I did. You know, that's what I did. Instead of, you know, investing it back in the school, instead of just giving $6,000 to each of my sons, I sent out an email and I said, I'm taking the whole family to Ireland. It's with your dad's life insurance policy, and he would like this. He wants this. This is good. So in September, the same company that had helped me buy these discount tickets for London and Paris, I wrote to him and I said, I need 13 tickets to Dublin. Some from Seattle, some from Austin. Get me the best price you can. And, and we did that. And um, it was like a reminder. Like the whole time, besides just the joy of seeing my grandkids, you know, running through the giant causeway in Northern Ireland or, you know, the streets of Dublin and 
Temple Bar and all these amazing places, hanging out with the guards. I mean, it was, just, it was so much fun. But I just felt this amazing sense of the pleasure of the Lord. Amen. You know, my middle son was wearing one of his dad's um, jackets. We share a lot in our family. And every time I'd see him, you see him in the distance, I just thought, that's Paul. And then, you know, all the part has his jacket. So I'm telling you this story because I expect everyone in this room has some things you really have a heart to do. And I'm not just talking about our prayer list. You know, we have our prayer list. God, send me Bible. God, help all of my family come to know you. God, healing for my loved ones. God, you know, provide for this and that. We all have our prayer requests. But I'm talking about your dreams. Think how many times Jimmy has shared about their walk from the Camino de Santiago. And what an encouragement that has been to this church. Every time he tells another story, I think, yes. You know, he did his dream. This was something that was just fermenting in his heart. I want to do this, Pat, and I want to do this. You know, this is going to be good. This is going to be a treasure. This is going to be a memory. This is valuable. Well, you know, was he preaching at every stop? No, he was sharing the love of Jesus to people along the way. And it was a good thing. So first thing, God, God wants to give you dreams. And a lot of you, you have locked the dreams you used to have up because it seems like there's no way, there's no way we can do that. That we can never afford that. Well, you don't know what God could do. Sometimes with man, things are impossible, but with God, everything's possible. Okay, the second thing I felt like God put on my heart is having to do with friendship. My oldest um, grand, um, daughter in law is a, a therapist, a Christian therapist. This is Gloria. Some of you know her. She has spoken at this church. She used to be a member here. She just turned 50 last month. Can you believe little Gloria? <laughs> yeah. So um, she is a Christian therapist, and she basically believes everyone should be in therapy. So she had my son in therapy, their whole marriage, and my grandkids in therapy. To be a therapist in Washington State, you have to be in therapy too. So everyone she knows is in therapy. So I think she's actually right. You know? I think it would do us all well if we could afford it, to have someone outside of the little circle of our dysfunctional family speak into our lives and say, hey, you know, this thing you just said, let's talk about where that comes from and what the root of that is and how we can get some freedom here. So it's not that I disagree with her, but I just realized that's what friends should be to each other. That's part of friendship, you know, to speak hope into each other's lives. Like that thing you shared about wishing you could do. Let's talk about how that can happen. Let me encourage you, like, what would you need? You know, let's put some time, you know, things on this. Let's see, how soon do you think this could happen? And, you know, like to just encourage each other in those things that are precious and personal to us. You know, going back to that scripture about God um, putting into our heart's desire, I really think it's like the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 13, that the Holy Spirit distributes gifts as He will. And I really think He distributes <coughs> These dreams, I think they, they come from the heart of God. He knows what will be precious to us. He knows what will create memories that will be part of who we are and be a blessing to each other. So not only being willing to be a dream manager for other people, which to me is not that hard, but to let people know your dreams. And not to think, oh, this is so silly, or this isn't very spiritual, you know, this sounds kind of carnal or selfish. Well, you know, it says, as you rejoice in God, He will give you those desires. Are you rejoicing in God? Do you love the Lord? Is that desire still there? Well, what if He gave you that desire? Because He wants to show His love for you by bringing it to pass. You know, so I think our friendships often become very superficial because we don't probe, we don't ask like Jesus asked, what do you really want? You know, we allow our conversations to be on this sort of superficial level when we are being invited in our relationships to um, encourage each 
other in these deep secret things. Um, I got a letter yesterday from um, Nathan Green. He's in jail again. And he's, um, his family used to come here. And I just love this boy. He, I just, I love him. Um, he spends most of his life in jail, but he's in recovery and he has issues. But he asked me, he says, Gail, I don't mean to be impertinent, but what do you really want during this time of your life? What do you really want? You know, what is God saying to you? And I ended up writing pages and pages last night, you know, because he, he, he probed. I remember I started my letter, no, you're not impertinent. I want friends like you in my life. I want people who care about where I really am and what I desire. So I may have told you this story too, but my best friend from high school, um, who actually was instrumental in Paul and I coming to the Lord, is named Robin. And Robin, um, he's, a, he's a mall Santa Claus during the winter. <laughs> he's got a big white beard down to here. And when we were young, um, he had this obsession about having a sailboat. And, um, I hadn't seen him much for about 40 years. I think one time he came and brought something to one of my kids that um, had been shared between our families, but I basically lost touch with him, and we have kind of reconnected. And this is a funny little story. He wrote me a letter a couple of years ago, and he said, um, Gail, I have this old MG van in the um, garage, and I'm thinking of um, selling it and making it a puzzle on the sailboat. And when I read that, I thought, this sounds strangely familiar. So I went through this old box I had from college, thumbing through the pages of a yearbook, and I found this letter from Robin saying, Gail, I'm thinking of selling the MGTV, you should have a little crank car, and buying a cell book. And I looked, and the dates were exactly 50 years apart. Fifty years later, he's selling an MG to buy a sailboat. And I thought, okay, I'm going to be a dream manager for this guy. <laughs> and I said, Robin, what will it take for you to get this boat? And he needed a little money for a deposit. Well, I happened to have a little money because my father was a gill nutter in Alaska when the um, Exxon Valdez um, oil spill happened, I think in 1989. And all the fishermen who lost a lot of their um, salmon were given some kind of settlement. Well, it was just 30 or 40 dollars a month, but it had been piling up since 1989. You know, so there was this fund that I inherited. And I said, listen, Robin, I will loan you this money to get you going on buying your boat. And it was just so fun, because that's what friends do for each other, right? So I was in Seattle last week, and we were sitting out on the dock of his boat in the freezing rain. And it was just, it was so wonderful, because he has a sailboat. And in a couple of weeks, he's buying an Airstream, and he's putting it on the beat, and he's going to get a boat fixed up, and he's going to become a boat bum, and as happy as a clam, and I got to be part of it. You know, so that's what friendship is. You know, you, you find out what is important to your friends, and you say, let me be part of it, let me walk alongside you in this. Okay, and this is the last part. I know it's all meaning, but this is the last part. Um, I really feel like God well, put on my heart that we need to be very proactive in this. Like, you know how at the beginning of the year you think I'm going to go on a better diet or I'm going to start exercising or I'm going to read the whole Bible from Genesis to Exodus, you know, or from Genesis through Exodus to Revelation, you know, two chapters a day. And like we come up with these great ideas and some of you might be thinking, I'm going to think about my dreams. You know, I'm going to like dust off a few of those. But I think it has to be more than that. I think if we just leave this place thinking, you know, yeah, God cares about my dreams and I want to encourage my friends, but we're not really committed to some plan, before you finish lunch, you will have forgotten it. So this is the hard part for me. I actually read this book to my seniors last year, and it recommends that you write down 100 dreams. Well, all 24 of my seniors did it, and I only got to number 48. And I feel kind of embarrassed, but I just, I was having a lot of trouble with it. So this is the recommendation from this business book. It says, write down 100 dreams. 
And I want to tell you the categories they can be in and how they suggest you do it. And, uh, you know, I don't expect you all to go right 100 before lunch, but I'm just saying be proactive about it. Because if you just say that's a good idea, that good idea will go the way of 10,000 other good ideas you had in 2019. So I brought you page one of my list, my short list. They also suggest you do it in a really nice journal. Well, I have all these great journals, but I'm so cheap I can't start writing in them because I think maybe I'll want to re-gift this to somebody. But I'm going to do better. My goal is to do better. So, um, so here's the beginning of my list, and no one can see it. it has some very personal things on it. So it says, write down 100 things you desire, 100 things that are dreams and goals in your personal life, and then divide them into these categories. And some of the dreams overlap in two or three categories, but these are the categories. Physical, you know, I, like I want to get stronger, thinner and stronger, you know, healthier, more <coughs> sore, um, emotional, you know, there's still triggers in my life at age 70 that should have been long crucified, you know, emotional, intellectual, oh, there's things I want to learn. There are so many things I yet want to study. You know, what do you want to learn? I'd love to learn Spanish, but I've just about given up on it. But still, you know, intellectual, spiritual, you know, God transformed me. God help me be more like Jesus. Lord, help me not to have that knee-jerk reaction to certain things in the body of Christ. Help me to not be that self-righteous person. Um, help me wash people's feet. Psychological. Material. Now, will God bless it if you really want a DeLorean? I don't know. <laughs> I think it sounds kind of greedy and materialistic myself, but it's not my dream list. You know, I'm not going to judge your dream list. You know, I just am glad to have a car that runs for heaven's sakes. But, you know, rejoice in the Lord and see what he plants in your heart. Um, professional. Um, those of you in careers, what would you like to see happen in your career in five years? Do you want to be exactly in the same position with exactly the same income? You know, would you like to take more leadership? Um, creative. I'm going to paint again. I haven't painted for years. I used to paint all the time. I haven't knit a sweater for 30 years. I've knit wonderful sweaters. A lot of my dream lists are restorations of things I gave up to be a school teacher. Adventure. I mean, anyone else want to walk on the Great Wall of China? You know, write it down for heaven's sakes. Don't just say, oh, this is impossible. Um, legacy. You know, at my age, that's important. You know, I want people to say nice things at my funeral. I also want them to wear bright colors and dance and have lots of live music and eat tacos. <laughs> but, you know, I want my story to be sweet. I want my grandkids to be proud that I was their grand. Yeah. They're all very proud every time they tell their friends my grandma's in jail right now. <laughs> every time, you know, every Wednesday afternoon, they'll tell somebody my grandma's in jail. <laughs> so you know, that's not really part of my legacy, I hope. And character, character development. Okay, so you write your list, and then you divide it into A, B, or C. A, I'm going to do this in 2019, this year, like this year in Jerusalem. This year, B, within five years. This is going to take me about five years. And C, before I die. You know, before I die. And give it some thought. And don't then throw it away. Like I did mine on a computer because I can go back and I can star the ones that I've finished. I can look at them and think, nah, I ain't going to do that. One of mine is. Let my hair go totally white for a year. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're not all very spiritual, trust me. <laughs> so, um, so I want to encourage you to be proactive and ask God, you know, to inspire you, to encourage you to know he's a good father. He puts into your heart desires. You reflect something about the heart of God to the world. And your victories, your successes, your adventures, God's provision in your life, it's a testimony. It's not a little thing. 
You know, I, when I told my students about going to Ireland without them, <laughs> that was a big deal to me. <laughs> You're gonna travel without us, we're gonna believe it. I said, yeah, God made a way, you know. I mean, it's, it's important, it's important. And it's not, of course, the whole gospel. All I'm asking you to do is consider um, believing that our good Father wants you to have your dreams fulfilled and that he will walk with you through it and to cultivate friendships of people who also stand with you in faith and might be willing to help you make the way because that's part of the body of Christ. So I'd like to pray for you. So Father, I just pray for the congregation of the New Church, Brownsville, Texas, that we will be a people who know your goodness, who know your abundance, that know you want to give us the desires of our heart, that that's who you are. And um, I just really pray for those of us who have boxed up dreams because we have felt unworthy or that they're impossible or because of some other religious deception, I pray that we'll be willing to dust them off and uh, dream again because you're the God of the possible. Amen. And, um, you and us is greater than every obstacle in the world. You're inviting us, Lord, to have wildly joyful expectations. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Gail, yes. I want to read this scripture just to affirm what God has spoke to us through you. Habakkuk 2 2. And the Lord answered, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets, so that he may run who reads it. No, so may we cool. run with our own vision. Yeah, that's beautiful. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to canoe down the Snake River. Yay! Yeah, I go. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll add that to mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's no more bizarre than some of mine. <laughs> <laughs>